Hello, guys. My name is Anima, the soul. I'm a manager and an artist. I will be hosting my own monthly show here on Dorf TV called Lives, in which I'll be talking to a handful of exclusive guests who aren't quite middle of the road in the way they live their lives, their jobs, their hobbies, or their sexuality. It is my own little educational program on diversity and tolerance, and um, I will try my best to visually adapt to each and every one of my precious guests. My first guest today is a cultural hybrid, much like me. Welcome, Anthony. Hello. Um, <laughs> um, on the outside, he's uh, pretty much like me, especially when dressed up in a costume like this. Very fancy <laughs> costume, by the way. Thank you. Um, <coughs> even though um, I might say that he's on an entirely different plane of individuality, in a way more physical than me. Now, I'm starting my show by having my guests introduce themselves. Um, because I think that the only person who can give true credit to yourself is you. So, Anthony, what do you think makes you out? Hmm, well, usually if people ask me to introduce myself, or usually they formulate it differently, they ask, what are you? <laughs> um, so, I found the best answer to that is to say, I'm a monster. <laughs> because um, saying that I'm a monster does not give them the ammunition to call me bad things before they know me. Mm -hmm. And it also makes them more interested in actually asking about who I am. Sounds very clever. Well, uh, it works. <laughs> and what exactly is a monster? Well, that depends. Most people think of movie monsters. But um, when I say I'm a monster, we usually enter into a dialogue and I get to explain that basically a monster is everyone who is not normal. And mm. when you come to think of it, normal is a very, very reduced thing that's not available to a lot of people. So when we look at history and at humanity in general, we find out pretty fast that uh, most normal people are white, straight males of a certain religion and a certain monetary income, if you want. Mm. And no matter where we go, it's usually the women, the people of color, the people whose bodies are different, mm. the people who have different beliefs or sexualities, who are not quite human and therefore can be considered monsters. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, educated people, or so, let's say some, some people who consider themselves educated, and in my way, in, in my, from, from my point of view, are educated people, do know that there is no such thing as normal. Statistically, there isn't. I mean, there is a bandwidth in which you might say, okay, we consider people who are, say, white, have a certain age, are fairly healthy, um, have a certain income, we consider that normal. But even that is, might be discussed, you know? There is no such thing as normality, is it? I mean, from my point of view, obviously there is, and you are living a different life too, but um, just scientifically, it is a fact that there is no such thing as normal. That's true. The last years especially have made a lot of people realize that there is no normal. There's no clear boundary between male and female, between white and colored. There's so many things in the world that we try to p make separate, which are really mixed up with each other. But even though a lot of people now know in their heads that there is nothing that's normal, culturally and as a society, we still have ingrained in ourselves this truth that a certain kind of thing is normal and another kind of thing is not, simply because it's something that is not part of the society, mm -hmm. whichever society that the person is living in. So if you go somewhere and you are conceivably different from the norm, mm -hmm. whatever that norm is at the moment, then you are not normal. And by not being normal, you are, even if most people are not aware of this, less than human. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of people who presume themselves to be normal and who don't mean any harm by it, a lot of the time even, of course there are those who do mean harm, mm -hmm. but even the ones who mean, who have well intentions, you know, good intentions and the road to hell, they usually do things or say things to people who are perceived as different, that are hurtful, violent, even bad, whatever you want. 
Um, but it's not because of spite or something, it's because of not reflecting. So if you go ahead and say, I'm a monster, before they even consciously make the decision that you are not normal enough, then you give them a chance to actually start thinking about what they are thinking, what they are doing. And that helps a lot, I find. I think that's bec that is because a lot of people get emotionally conditioned on a certain norm. And then when you give them the opportunity to, or you basically you are faster than their emotional reaction and you're sort of cutting in, it's sort of a shock tactic in a positive way that starts them thinking and really reflecting about, hey, you know, who am I? What is this? Where am I? You know, and then they have to basically recalibrate their system or reboot. And then you're basically giving them the chance to, to start thinking about, you know, identities. That's right. That's a very intelligent thing to do. Now, what projects are you working on right now? <laughs> well, if you ask me like that, you're kind of expecting me to give you a definite answer. <laughs> um, my, in my opinion, all of life is the project. Because mm. as a monster, I'm not within the boundaries that make people behave or live life in a certain way. Judith Jack Halberstam has defined a term that says queer time and space is something that people live in or have or experience who are not so normal that they actually fit into normative space mm -hmm. on time. So if you have normative time, you would be someone who is born, lives, uh, goes through puberty, um, has sex, relationships, possibly family, children, and dies. Mm. But when you're too queer, then suddenly this timeline gets distorted. Mm -hmm. And you might have puberty, and then a kind of first death, and then a kind of second puberty, and uh, different sexualities all mix into one life. So suddenly everything is different, right? So when you ask me about my projects, it's basically that I try to live my life true to my monstrosity by questioning if what I do is what I want to do or what is expected of me to do. So it's starting with a questioning of identity and then goes on to a questioning of general lifestyles, the way you others live their lives and yeah all of us live our lives and like the fears that we are encountered with like when parents ask you what will you do what will mm -hmm. your education be when friends mm -hmm. ask you what will you live off all the things that a lot of people are asked especially artists and you suddenly go like why are the people asking me that is it because they worry about me is it because they worry about themselves is it because it's expected of you you know you start to question things and you make art out of that so you're living in a very fluid concept of identity, of time, of space, of, of, of a life, basically. Yeah. Um, but that, does that mean that you don't... But you do make plans, right? Well, kind <laughs> of. I go like, this is what I want to do. And then I watch myself doing it and see what actually happens. And I, I try to keep questioning because... Even people who are very different, like me and you possibly, and mm. a lot of other people, fall into the same kinds of traps where you presume that something has to be this way or that this is the truth or the reality. And if you stop questioning yourself and your motivation and what you're doing, then you suddenly find yourself in this spot where you behave in certain ways that are not necessarily you, but something that has been told or taught to you that you are just repeating. Yeah, which hits on the, the issue of masks. That is my own specific research project for life. <laughs> 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 and I've always tried to sort of make them make that be make that disappear or make things more liquid, even though I think I'm a different I have a different personality because I tend to over plan. Um, I do understand what is how peop how people who are m going with the flow more, are living their lives. And I do appreciate that. I mean, there are spirits in my life where I actually do go with the flow and see where it takes me. Um, I'm not sure, though, if, if, if that's good or bad. Maybe it's just, you know, everybody takes his or her own choice mm. and has his or, own, his or her own decision and, and plan. I mean, I do tend to plan a lot. 
that's probably what makes me different from most artistic people I know. Even though I wouldn't say, I wouldn't limit myself to saying that I'm artistic, but you are too, you're a monster. So a monster is yeah. a monster. It's not <laughs> something that stops, you know, like. Yeah, it's true. Same with me. So yeah, I think that's where one similarity is. That the way we're trying to make lives more, or we're trying to eventually reach a more liquid state of life, the mind, identities, yeah. Um, okay, so which means that I can basically scratch most of my questions. <laughs> 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 because this is, you know, the usual way interviews are still, a lot of interviews are still being led is, uh, are very precise questions. So let me just check and, and scroll through them if I and see if I can find something. Yeah, of course. Then, but you're a monster. So what do you think, it sounds like a corny question in this context, but how would you perceive a man, a woman or a human to be? What, what, what is a human for you? What is a man or a woman for you? Do those uh, concepts even matter? For well, it's a very monster? difficult question <laughs> because for the monster, they don't necessarily matter. But as a monster, basically, I look at life like this. There are lots of areas and most of these areas have boundaries around them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, men and women mm. are areas, masculinity, femininity, everything that are well, demarcated by boundaries. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're inside and you fulfill the boundary definitions, you know that you are a woman or a man. Mm. And you recognize if someone is outside because they don't fulfill the prerequisites for being inside, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot about these boundaries that's not solid, where they blur, where they dissolve. And most people can ignore that. So they never question their male, female space or identity or whatever, body. Uh, and then there are a lot of people who are aware of these dissolving areas. Mm -hmm. For example, in medicine, we found out that there's not really a... I mean, there are lots of differences between men and women, but they're not clear cut. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the same hormones in different mixes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chromosomes can do weird stuff and so on. Bodies can be very, very different, right? And I guess as a monster, you kind of fall outside of these boundaries, which can be an advantage because you can look at it all from farther away. You can get a perspective on everything. Mm -hmm. If you care to do it, you have to put some effort in it, right? So for me, basically, um, if you ask me what's a man, what's a woman, I'd say ask the people you meet. And if they say they're a woman or a man, then that's good for me, you know? If that's what they see themselves as, don't question it. It's their, it's their life, their body. They have to know it, right? Or they have to declare what they want or feel to be, right? And um, a monster, on the other hand, that's a very, very diffi difficult question. There have been lots of people who wrote and researched monsters and wrote about what makes a monster. Mm. And there are some specific ones that everybody recognizes, and then there are others that are only monstrous in context. But basically what's, um, what's similar with all monsters is that they are not easily contained in any such boundaries. Mm -hmm. They are too, too weird, too chaotic, they change too much, they're too hybrid between things that don't mix. So basically, when you have someone or something that's not easily categorized, that doesn't um, adhere to all those boundaries, then you can say you have a monster. But again, as with men and women, I would say if you see or meet someone or something that you think that's a monster, you might do good to ask them, what do you think you are? Mm? Mm. Who do you think you are? How do you define yourself? It's mm. like asking people their preferred pronouns nowadays. It's if they say, I'm a monster, then they are fine with it. If they don't like to be a monster or to be seen as a monster, then you should respect that, right? That's a very good attitude. Actually the best, I can imagine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but to go back to a more linear uh, set of questions. Now, you're a monster right now, but you must have originated from somewhere, <laughs> from some place, right? And I would be interested in what 
turned you or what, what caused this transformation of sorts? Were there people that inspired you or did it just come from out of yourself um, or both? Or, or w were there any specific incidents in your life that inspired you to, to like, for, for instance, build this, this specific costume mm. or, or others? Well, I guess the question of where do you come from is easily answered for everybody. <laughs> we all come from our mothers. Yeah, of if course. If you know them or not, <laughs> so it's like, where do you come from? I come from my mother. <laughs> um, as to whether I had role models, if you want to, well, I guess I was always a little different. When I was a kid, I had asthma, so mm -hmm. I was not with the other kids a lot. I was in hospital and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I couldn't do all the things I wanted. So that set me apart at an early age, without mm -hmm. being very positive, I guess. But a good thing about, is, about it was that I got to watch a lot of TV, which is <laughs> fine for kids, you know? Mm. And as I watched TV, I kind of realized subconsciously that there's nobody in those films that I can identify with. Mm -hmm. I'm not the princess, I'm not the knight. I'm yeah. not, you know, like, there's like, yeah. in the 80s, we had these very limited very role primitive. models. Mm -hmm. And um, even the exceptional people were pretty standard in their own way. Um, but there were people on television that were different and who I kind of really identified with. And those were the monsters. So I watched Star Wars as a kid. That was Chewbacca. Yeah. He inspired me for my first uh -huh. <laughs> beast costume, if you like. Mm -hmm. And um, then there was Vincent and the Beauty and the Beast series. Ah, yeah, that's, that was wonderful. Yeah, I love that He was acted too. by Ron Perlman. He's a great role model uh -huh. because even without a mask, <laughs> he doesn't look very standard. Uh -huh. And he's a very yeah. interesting person about monstrosity too. Hmm. So those were the ones who inspired me to actually physically manifest the beast, the difference, the monster that I kind of started to feel inside of me or to have creeping up on me as a realization, right? Mm -hmm. So I started as a kid to make little costumes with masks on them mm -hmm. and fur to manifest <laughs> my monstrosity. Mm -hmm. And I ran a wild in the woods wearing those things. And sometimes I might have scared some people passing by. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if they got scared or just puzzled. Mm -hmm. And um, as I grew older, I realized this is basically myself and my art. This is how I can express things about myself that I need to express and that I don't necessarily understand at the time that I express mm -hmm. them, but can come back to later to reflect on them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how it started. Yeah, I that a lot too, even though I'm a very, um, I'm a very rational person and I try to plan a lot. I have been experiencing events when I did something and different other, even deeper connotations came dawned upon me much later. So that was interesting. I wasn't actually c calculating this, but I like that. I like it when life surprises me, basically. Yeah. Did you, you, you do, you did, I mean, I, w um, I took a look at your Facebook um, page and um, you did a couple of performances um, in, in, the, in public areas, yeah. like in Museumsquartier Wien and stuff. Um, how do people react to you? and the positive and the negative. Um, and it, were there any especially positive reactions that you can recall that, that, that touched you? Hmm. Well, the funny, thing about in a, as a, the funny thing about manifesting your own monstrosity and the be about being upfront about it mm -hmm. and positive about it. So basically I um, just took what other people put out there for mm. people like me. Mm -hmm. And I took this basically negative thing and turned it into my own personal positive thing, right? Mm. And since I've done that, I actually have not had bad reactions. Mm -hmm. The worst reaction that I ever had, and that's not really bad, is that someone asked me at a restaurant, who, oh, you you're like your nails, because I'm perceived as male most of the time. And I was like, yeah, haven't you ever seen a guy with lacquered nails before? And that was it, you know? So that's not bad by most standards. But the positive reactions are very massive sometimes. I have done performances where people came to me afterwards and said, thank you very much, you have done something for me here. Some people even cry sometimes. Yeah. And I'm always surprised by this because I think it's nothing special that I'm doing here, it's just me. 
-hmm. being available for other people. But it's good to know that a lot of people actually gain something from uh, my, my own visibility, basically. So mm. some people might think that this is narcissistic to yeah. talk so much about yourself or something. But no. I mean, it's the same as when straight people tell gay people not to talk so much about being gay in a culture that is so massively invested in normativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The abnormal has to be visible, has to speak out, has to have its own voice mm. to balance things. Because otherwise, a lot of people think that the normal is all there is. And that makes a lot of people sad or worse than sad because the normal is a very violent thing for many people. It's true, because it limits people and it dehumanizes people to a very high degree, very often. Not always, you know. Um, well, I, I had a lot of positive reactions too, but I, I'm just starting <coughs> to think whether the negative reaction I had that really scared me um, was actually a negative one um, at all. And what was it, if I um, can ask? Well, I, that was the first time I was actually, I was in a different suit. Uh, that is very, very much a warrior type of suit. And I was out with my friends, who was Chris, who also is, um, yeah, well, Chris and, 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 and Anna, um, two friends of mine, so a male and a female, and we were in a group, mm -hmm. which already gives you some sort of protection. And I wasn't sure, because this was my first time out, and I wanted to actually watch study reactions that I get. And I was feeling really good, uh, good and strong, which, which was okay, so I'm, I'm sure that what I radiated wasn't wrong. And there were a lot of people taking photos, which was fine. There were a lot of people who really liked it. We went to a, a lecture by Franz Hörmann at that on that day. Uh, but there was, uh, we were, Chris and Anna live in, the, say, in a quarter that has a lot of Turkish males in it. And uh, I don't care. I mean, I've been li I lived in London and, and I've lived with Pakistani people, Indian people, whatever. But in this specific quarter, you, those guys were always, I mean, when I'm walking around as a natural woman and normally looking, you know, uh, you, you would get reactions. Of course, they'd cheer and they'd whistle and whatever. That's fine with me. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't bother me. But in this specific context, we, were, we met a group of um, Turkish guys and you could see that by the way they, they stared at us. I mean, I was doing something to their mind. I don't know what <laughs> exactly it was, but obviously uh, it changed something in them. I was, pro I was probably toying uh, unwantingly in, in this context, toying with their worldview. Um, and they were like getting really, it was a mixture between lusty and aggressive and very close to jumping on us, you know, and we all felt it because we're all sensitive people. And I'm, I'm really scared, you know, something really big and the negative has to happen that get, gets me scared. But that situation was really extreme because we thought they, they are gonna, they're gonna rape us, you know? It was really like, you could feel it. It was, the air was thick. <laughs> you could basically grab it. And that really scared me. I mean, on one hand, of course, it's a positive reaction because um, it changed something in them. You know, obviously, I wasn't representing what they envisaged to be a woman uh, in the first place. <laughs> that was obvious. But on the other hand, you know, uh, this, this, this feeling of aggression in it uh, wasn't quite what I expected or would have wanted. And I'm not sure. This, it, still, it still puzzles me. That was two years ago. So um, it's, still, it's still something that I'm, I keep on thinking about because this is definitely not something I, I wanted to... I mean, these days I don't, as as you you mentioned before, I don't think about the reactions I get. It just feels natural for me. But it was difficult to slip into any kind, any, any one of those suits at first, because I'm a very reflective person, and I part of it was natural for me. But the other part was, I, at first, I was envisaging. I, I I knew that there would be reactions, and um, in a way. I wanted it to be provocative, but as I said, not that evening. <laughs> you know, I was too focused on my own, and and I was out with friends, and 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 I was curious, so that that was kind of scary. But 
the rest of the uh, I had a lot of people, especially with this costume, funny enough, um, intersexual people or the people who are concerned with metamorphosis that really like it. And this is what it's called. It's an animorphosis. This is my metamorphosis. It's not ready yet. It would have a lot more butterflies, but it's a very intense costume. So, But uh, the focus should be on you. So yeah. <laughs> not on me, but Actually, it's, it's I wanted to say yeah. something um, about the reaction you got. Mm -hmm. So... Basically, there are people in this world who can become invisible to people's aggressions. So if I take off my mask and I go out there, especially if I take off my lacquer mm -hmm. and my ring and things like that, I can become invisible because I pass mm -hmm. as normal, right? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you put on a mask or a costume, you don't pass. You are obviously not normal. And it doesn't matter on the, national the nationality or the culture. Mm -hmm. There are always people who feel threatened by that which is not normal, by that which does not pass, because it, it disturbs their perception of reality. Mm -hmm. And that's a really threatening, frightening experience. Mm -hmm. And it might just at the same time, it might be very alluring, which is even more threatening because for many people, reality is made up out of sexuality, right? Mm -hmm. Out of this border between male and female and this desire, which is proper or improper for the other sex or even the same sex, depending on how tolerant the culture is, right? Mm. But then there are people also like me who can never become really invisible because um, if I go out there and I'm fully clothed, then I pass. But if I take off my clothes, I don't pass anymore. Like a lot of people, actually. A lot of mm -hmm. people just don't have the perfect body they envision for themselves. They're too fat or too thin or too dark or too light or whatever, you know? And they suffer because they're not normal enough. Or most of them, at some point, suffer. And I actually have another manifestation of myself because I was really bothered by my invisibility. A lot of people aspire to become invisible, to become normal within society, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't really enjoy it because this normal passing person is not me. Mm -hmm. It's just a reflection, a projection of people's desires for what I could or should be so that their world stays the same, stays safe, stays normal, right? And um, my other projection of myself is basically when I do nude performances or pictures. The elf. Yeah, because um, you saw some of the pictures. The elf um, looks very alluring sometimes, very androgynous even, but in a sexual kind of way. Mm -hmm. So most people look at a picture and they see something desirable. Mm -hmm. When they, when they look closer, they see that what they kind of felt was desiring is not exactly something they would allow themselves to desire or mm -hmm. which would be proper to desire because it's not male or female. Mm -hmm. And I also have pictures with dead animals. So I lived in the countryside and they died and they decided it's too sad to just put a life on the trash heap, you know? So what can I do with it? And in our society, it's not just the bodies that are different, the sexualities that are different that make people frightened mm -hmm. and aggressive. It's also sickness or death. Mm -hmm. We don't really see old age people except when they're still pretty good and mobile and uh, in the area of their homes. We don't see sick people because they go to the hospital to die or to become better when they can come out again. We don't see people who are ma massively different from the norm, either mentally or physically, because they are put in special institutions. Mm -hmm. So basically we hide all the people who don't live up to our normal reality. And we pretend that they just don't exist so that our reality can be real. Yeah. But then I ask myself, what is real? Mm. The thing that's supposed to be real or the thing that I show to the world, which looks like a fantasy, but actually just points towards something that is happening all over the place all the time. Yeah. And that's why I do it. Yeah, that's why I do it as well. <laughs> 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 but uh, coming back to that elf personality, mm. that is something that um, deals, plays, um, with a different topic, the topic of n normative bodies. Um, the usually we do have this male-female gender dichotomy. 
So this is a man, and a man is supposed to have a penis or whatever, and no breasts, and a woman is supposed to have breasts and a vagina, usually, to put it bluntly. Um, now, um, I know you're a monster right now, and I really do not want to interfere in, in, in your personal space, but you're adult enough to, you know, to talk about what you want to talk about. Um, I'm not sure how to tackle this, so you're slightly also physically, on a physical level, you're slightly different from what is perceived to be uh, the norm. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, would, you, would you like to, to explain that further or to, to talk about this further? Um, or, is it, or would you like to remain open? Well, open is a nice thing because it leaves more people's options open too, not just mine. But um, yeah, I realized that um, rather early stage during puberty that I'm not exactly the way people are supposed to be. So as we, as, as we said, we grow up in this world that says there are men and women and that's all there is, right? For mm -hmm. most of us, that's the reality. Only a few people are, have a more advanced worldview, if you want, or a mm -hmm. more open worldview. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily advanced as such. And um, when I realized that I'm not what I'm supposed to be, that I'm not going to grow up into what I feel that I am, or well, who, who I feel you? that I am, um, I realized that I might be something else. So okay. basically, I started out as a girl, mm -hmm. and consequently, I thought I might be a boy, because those are the options, right? Yeah. And um, I'm very happy with my decisions and my body. Mm -hmm. I took the, mesh, the steps to change as much of it as I wanted to. Okay. And, um, but of course, it leaves me with a hybrid body that is neither one or the other. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I found out that really is a problem for most people, no matter how open or which gender or sexuality. It's really a major, a major problem because we don't grow up in a world that has this option. Mm -hmm. We grow up thinking there are men and women and there are homosexuals, heterosexuals, bisexuals, but we don't know how to handle the fact that there are actually not just me, a lot of people whose bodies are neither the one nor the other mm -hmm. that are more open that don't ha come with a manual that says, this is the way you treat people, or this is the way you love people, or this yeah. is the way you see people. S and love really should be about the soul, and not so much about some manifestation of something that I perceive to be a man or a woman, in a way. Uh, but I, I know from my own experience, uh, like the first time I encountered Chris, which is a friend who is physically similar, um, I took him for, well, he is a guy, but I, I thought, you know, okay, I saw his chest, I saw his hair, and I thought, okay, masculine, you know, there's the... And then uh, at some point I found out that uh, it's not that easy, <laughs> it's mm. not that defined, and that really puzzled me. So for a while, I, I, I was sort of watching myself talk, um, and sometimes I called him him, and sometimes I called him her, and, and people were laughing all the time, people knew both of us, and they were going like, called him a she again, you know, and I didn't know what was happening, and why my brain was putting out those funny, th this funny terminology, because I, I, I saw him, but, but for some reason, even though I'm not as, as simple-minded, at least I thought so, um, I kept on calling, uh, it, it just totally puzzled me. It vanished though, after like two weeks or so, it, 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 it was gone. And now he, he is a he for me, because this is like he wants to be addressed. And that's fine with me, but it's, I, 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 can, I can totally relate to it. It wasn't something that shocked me or hurt me, but it was confusing. Yes. <laughs> and actually, I mean, it's understandable, because if you meet someone who's not a he or a she, what do you call them? There's not even a word in our language. Yeah. Of course, some people refer to others like it, but that's not something that you call a person. That's mm -hmm. something that you call a thing. Right? Or a little, little or bit. Or an animal or a child. monster. That's one of the reasons I am a monster now. Yeah. It's because I realized that people, not meaning harm, do things that they encounter things that they can't handle outside of monstrosity because there's no such thing as a human who's not a he or a she. Mm. It's still human, kind of, you know, in our mm. culture. Um, there are efforts to change language and there are in different languages, there are different terms that you can try to use. But I actually sometimes like to use they because if people ask me, I say mon I'm a monster, I don't say I'm a man or I'm gay or something because it's not true. Yeah. You know, I'm not a man, I'm 
since I'm not a man, I can't actually be gay. And so there's no, there's not really a space and language for mm -hmm. this kind of diversity. So you can use they because they implies that there's more than one option, mm -hmm. which is good. But it's also, it's something people can't do because you're not used to calling a single person with a plural pronoun, right? Yeah. So it's really, it's really something that will probably evolve throughout time as our society keeps evolving and keeps diversifying. And when this is something that's become normal, then we have something else that's not normal that we have to adapt to, I guess. So it's always interesting how, you, how your brain notices that things are hard or difficult, even though you think it's not that difficult because you understand or you believe you understand and because you even like it, but it's still something that you haven't been prepared for, right? Yeah, I loved it. As I say, that's, that was one of those moments where life keeps on surprising you and things aren't as clear and as obvious as, as they're supposed to be. And that was actually a very cool moment. Yeah. Now, <laughs> let me ask you a last question. Um, if you could change one thing, um, just one thing. That's very, a very limited question, but I have to limit it somehow. <laughs> um, if you could just change one thing about the way people think, act, societal norms, what would that be? That's a really difficult question. Mm, I guess if it could be anything, I would hope that people would be less scared. Because in my experience, it's not so much the someone is different, or something is unknown. It's it's never it's never the reason that's stated that's making trouble. You know, it's never violence is never the result of just difference. Mm. Difference itself is not enough to cause violence. In my experience, it's it's fear. It's it's the threat of the other. You know, so no matter if it's a child that misbehaves, a person that's from another area of the world speaks a different language, has a different religion. It's not about the woman who behaves in a way that the man doesn't like. It's always about the threat. It's always about the person having a fear inside of them, even if they don't know it. It manifests itself in anger or intolerance or hate. And I guess if people could be less afraid, if they could be more open without the fear to direct where they're going, then this world could be a very, very interesting place, even more than it already is. And I think that you're writing in your, in your essay that's called The Emancipation of Monsters, that the future, this is what the future in your mind will hopefully look like. Well, I have hope in that direction because when you look at our world 100 years ago, mm. and you look at it now, then mm. you can certainly imagine that 100 years from now, it will be a place that is hardly recognizable to the people from 200 years back, you know? Mm. Because the things that we do today, the things that women and men can do today, the way we live today in this part of the world and in others is so different from what we did before. So much more open, mm. so much more tolerant, if you like, and diverse, that there's really no limit to people there's no limit to what we can be or become or how we can live, how we can treat our planet. There's, no, there's nothing we can't do if we want to. But as long as we're afraid and as long as we're greedy because we are afraid, there are so many things that we can do wrong. Yeah. So many things that are not necessarily wrong in themselves, but that turn out to be not good for everybody, just good for some people and bad for a lot of others. Yeah, so it, the world, I do see that too. I mean, you can see it in, in pop culture. You can see it everywhere, basically. The whole trend of sustainability, of, of diversity, is definitely on the rise. So let's hope that one day we're all liquid enough and unafraid enough to truly live ourselves the way we want to live our lives without constantly having to be in a clash, basically. Mm. So let's hope things get more liquid all in all. Yeah, that would be nice. So those were my questions for today. Thank you very much, Anthony, for being here. Thank you, Anima. And um, looking forward to my next guest um, and my next interview, and that will be the end of money as we know it. <laughs> <laughs>